I, I got one here for you. You got it. There he is. Stop it up. What are you doing out there? Great to have you here, and I know that uh, you, you've gotten in and you've already met a lot of these people. Um, you can't go in. I saw yes. you in the hotel trying to just walk, and you had a lot of people wanting to talk to you. Well, I'm glad to be here. You know, well, yeah. It's great to have you here, and uh, I was talking about um, when you started in music, before you, you, you got with the Sweets, before Elvis, you were on what's called the Chitlin Circuit. Music. Yeah. Tell us about that. That's like playing the Palo Theater, the Vega Theater in Chicago, um, Tiffany Theater in Chicago, you know, doing all the circuits like that. And playing with groups like the Flamingos and uh, Bell Vikings, Betty Wright, you know, it just was a whole lot of fun. But one thing about the Palo, if you go up there and play and you didn't sound right. They'll throw eggs at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. They throw eggs at you to me. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> you got to be good to, to make it there. Oh yeah. I mean that was that was the challenge right there. You go up there and you play and you do the job right. The people appreciate it. If they didn't, they throw eggs at you and move you off the stage. <laughs> So you, you hook up at some point in the 60s with the Sweet Inspirations. How did you get that, that gig with the Sweets? Well, I was playing with Martha Reed and Van Ellis. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and the Sweets needed a drummer. And the guitar player was from Washington, D.C. And I used to stand up and play drums behind my back and everything and do the split. So what? <laughs> I mean, it was very hard to do, but I did. <laughs> but uh, I played with him, and what he did, he came up to me and said, Stump, I need a drummer for the Sweet Inspirations. <clears throat> and I told him, I said, well, okay, I, I take the job. So I got the job with the Sweets, stayed with them for about 12 years. Wow. And then we got the job with Elvis. That's right. The Sweets. The, the, uh, the Sweet Inspirations and their band, uh, but originally the offer wasn't to the Sweet Inspirations and their band, it was just to the Sweets. Well, the whole thing was Elvis hired the Sweets for the Sweet Inspiration to back him up. Mm -hmm. He didn't hire the band. So the Sweets had to pay them for the band. Our salary, rooms, and transportation and everything. And then after we stayed with them for a while, for some reason, the Elvis started paying for the band. Yeah. I played behind the Elvis, so he said, well, this man is good. I, I want to keep him. Because <laughs> <laughs> you guys used to open all the shows. You would play behind all the people that opened the shows for us. And maybe some of the staff put there, the employers. Yep. Everybody there, I played behind everybody up there. And then I had a chance to play. I was needed to drum because Ronnie took something happened. His wife had a baby or something. And I had to sit in the with no rehearsal. And let me tell you, when you do that behind the Elvis Presley, I mean, Elvis really had a great set of drummers all the way through, DJ Fontana, Ronnie Tut, Stump Monroe, I mean, yeah, as DJ Fontana used to say, I just followed his butt. I can't see. <laughs> yeah. That, that, you, no, that, not just back there. Yeah. You had to follow everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Elvis Presley was one of a kind. Nobody else would never be like Elvis. Never see you again, and you got a whole lot of people trying to be Elvis. Yeah. But it would never be another Elvis. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of Elvis fans out there like myself that like to collect all the concerts, the recordings of the concerts. And there's many times talking about the fun Elvis had. 
um, and how playful he was. There's many times that I would hear Elvis introduce J.D. Sumner in the Stumps Quartet. I mean, he, he seemed to work your name into a lot of areas. Well, you know, the whole thing was Elvis was the type of person, once you get to know Elvis, you get to get to know him, you know? Mm -hmm. And me and him became really good friends. His whole thing was when he hit that stage, Elvis had fun. Yeah. If you don't have fun on stage, there's no reason being up there. Yeah. When, when the first time I seen him have fun up there, when he came out, he was so serious, and I said, wow, man, look at, look at Elvis. And all of a sudden, I seen him fall on the floor. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with Elvis? <laughs> and he falls with his leg and started singing. <laughs> and, the people, and the people went crazy. <laughs> you, know, you don't see nobody. There's nobody else can do that with Elvis Presley. Yeah. 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 So you got to know Elvis as a person, and I, I heard this story about one time you were invited to a big after party in his suite. Uh, he, he invited you to, to yeah. see that party. He used to have these parties up at, well, oh, right. at the International, yeah, yeah. or even uh, the Hilton. Mm -hmm. well, what he did, he had a party, oh, and I didn't go. I was running after women at the International. <laughs> 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 you know, ain't no reason lying about it, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> The whole thing was he see me the next day and said, Stump, no, why he didn't come upstairs? I said, well, he, he, I never call him balls. Because he wasn't my balls, he was my friend. So I called him E.P. or Elvis. That's what he wanted us to call him. When you become his, his friend. And he said, why he didn't come upstairs? And I told him why, he said, well, I would like for you to come up to the next party. And then the reason he did that is because he wanted me to come up and get, get my TCB. So he wanted to put my TCB on my neck. And I didn't know it. But that is just... around him that loved him but there's an issue that comes up every now and then about Elvis of people that do their research online and they look at sources that kind of back up what their preconceived notion is so they find sources to back that up most of the time those sources in any subject they do is not real um, there's always been things saying that Elvis stole the black man's music now, I've heard stories of people like Fats Domino and Little Richard and all those people saying, James Brown, they loved Elvis. Yeah. You can speak to this. It's true. Well, uh, I see Red Fox there used to come there all the time, see Elvis. Uh, Wayne Newton. Mm -hmm. I've seen, uh, uh, I can't think of his name now. Uh, you gotta excuse me, but if you have three strokes and, and a kid, two kidneys operation, your mind goes sometimes, you know. But uh, a whole lot of people used to come to see Elvis all the time. Yeah. James Brown, you know, and, and they just come see him and hug him and party, come to the party, rock the Elvis, and everybody was so friendly. And what I liked about Elvis was some of the people that I knew that played in the band with other stars used to tell me, when these stars come over to these parties, do, do the, uh, Elvis tell you not to speak to those people? I said, no, man. Elvis tell us to go and speak to the people, mingle with them. Now, that's because he was a good man, see? And he always wanted, he always wanted everybody in his audience to know everybody up on that stage. He, he wasn't the type of person to go on the stage and, and hug the stage and don't want nobody else to be known. He always wanted everybody to be known up on that stage. Yeah. He treated all of you equally. 
He didn't see color. He, he treated everyone equally. He didn't have no favor. Yeah. You know, I mean, if he didn't like you now, he'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you know. I'm the same way. <laughs> it's a good way to pay. Hey, I got to be honest with people. I love people. I go out and kind of perform, and that's what I do. But if somebody turned me the wrong way, I don't mess with him. Yeah. There you go. And uh, he had a, a love for you that was just kind of like big brother, little sister kind of thing. But tell us about that Memphis Mafia princess. Okay. Well, a, a lot of the, excuse me, I've had a lot of people ask me, uh, did they call you Memphis Mafia princess? And who was Memphis? No, 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 no. That's the name of my book. <laughs> and Ma Memphis Mafia princess is just a metaphor. It, it's, it just means we were all treated like princesses and to be there, all the Memphis Mafia treated us all like princesses. So it was, it was, yeah. So how did you meet Elvis? How did you meet, how did you get into the uh, to the Elvis world? Oh gosh. Well, I, I had heard Elvis's music, I, I loved his music. You know, his music, I finally figured it out, why so many people love to listen to Elvis Presley. The, when you were a child and you, your mom would sing you lullabies, it was soothing. Well, Elvis's voice was like mm -hmm. a lullaby. When you think about, not, not the rock and roll stuff, but the song yeah. stuff, it's so soothing. And so it's, it's like he's singing you his own personal little lullaby. But I, I, met, uh, I met Elvis, uh, well actually I met Joe first, obviously. Uh, I went to go see a show uh, in Las Vegas and my sister and another couple, my sister and her husband and another couple, they wanted to um, go see the Elvis show. And I had lived in Vegas at the time and I said, well, it's really hard to get in, but let's go see. So they set, um, they set my sister and her husband over here, and they set the other couple that she was with over there, and they put me by myself. And I'm like, well, why am I by myself? I don't want to sit here by myself. So I, um, I started to leave, and I said, well, I'll just come back and see Elvis when I'm with friends. And then they said, no, 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 we want to put you, well, don't leave, don't leave, we'll put you up front. So they put me right up front, you know, I was like this, because I was like, why am I going to stay? You know, I'm like, oh my, name. and I, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, well, I'll wait till, do you, you guys remember Jackie Kahane? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so he was great. So he was on. I thought, well, when he's finished, I'll run, you know, like I'm leaving to go to the bathroom or something. Because I really wasn't comfortable with my head back and everything. And, and I live in Vegas, so I could see all this any anytime. So, um, so the guy comes up to me and says, would you like a better seat? And I'm like, this is pretty up there, right? Where, where, where else are you gonna put me? So he puts me in the center booth, and all these people are sitting in the booth, and I'm going, oh, they just kind of pick people randomly out of the audience and put them in a booth, right? And the people are in the booth, I don't know who they are, and the one girl's going, oh yeah, he bought me this, he bought me that, and she's, but not in a, in a condescending way, but you know, just the rings, so many beautiful rings she had on her hand, and I didn't know who they were. And then Elvis comes on stage and he says, my dad said, stand up, daddy, stand up, daddy. And his dad stands up, and I'm going, oh my gosh, the guy sitting next to me was Elvis Presley's dad. <laughs> I had no clue. So then, I, then there's an empty space next to me, and this guy comes walking up, and he goes, well, are you enjoying the show? And I said, yeah. I said, you're not a major D, are you? And he says, no, my name's Joe Esposito. And I was like, oh my gosh. So then afterwards, I went backstage, and I met Elvis and all, and it was, it was fun, you know, yeah. that's, and then I guess Joe and I were really friends for uh, a few months and we just fell in love, so, yeah. <laughs> Part of it. There you go. Have a seat there with us. We were just, I was telling them, you've been popping up a lot this week on stage. You know, I've done good. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this week has been busier than I've ever been in <laughs> the four years I've been coming. I, I usually come and just do like the gospel show and, uh, and then the Elvis on screen show yeah. those uh, bills. Well, you keep saying yes when they ask you. So you know, they did. It just, just rolls. You, when I get these uh, texts from her, hey, do you mind, uh, would you want to do this? And, well, I'm here, so I might as well, <laughs> I might as well stay busy. You know, so. I hope y'all don't think it's just mine, because you've seen all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
let's just get the you know let's just get this out of the way first. Um, at what age did this voice arrive? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my my dad was a minister, and he took me to a gospel quartet singing when I was about ten years old. And uh, I actually that's when I first saw J. D. Sumner and wow. the stand. I mean, not the stand. He was with the Blackwood Brothers yep. at the time. Um, and the bass vocal just got my attention for some reason. And from that point on, I, that was all I could think about. And as my voice started to change uh, as a teenager, then I just began to sing low, and I would just keep low, you know, lower and lower. And I'd get some records, I'd sing along with and match the bass vocal on the records. And wow. I did that enough, and then, you know, smoked a lot of cigarettes, drank a lot of whiskey. <laughs> No, I didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> to, to be a... <laughs> Cut that out. Um, <laughs> no, we can't. Um, to be a bass singer standing next to J.D. Sumner is like being a baseball player standing next to Hank Aaron. I mean, it's well, the, thank you, for you know, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's J.D. Sumner, well, I mean, it's the guy you saw when you were uh -huh. 10 years old. How did you, how did it wind up that you end up standing next to J.D.? And then you know, it, actually, I think the two bass singer thing was, was primarily Elvis's idea, because Elvis, Elvis always thought that J.D. was like this huge star, and he was in the, in the gospel world. Um, and you saw that he was getting older, and I think I was at one point said, "Listen, JD, I want you to stop traveling so much because when he, when I was what touring, would still go out and do our gospel tour, mm -hmm. and so J, uh, Elvis wanted to JD to set it up so he could just stay at home and just work for Elvis and not do the gospel tour, so I'd have a second basis singer to do that. And that's when they hired uh, Richard Sturman. Mm -hmm. You know, he was actually the uh, first." Second basic. Yeah. Um, and then when he <laughs> went over his boys, I, I took his place. But it, um, you know, fortunately, I didn't have an ego because he would, you know, every night part of our part of our gospel show would be him, him burning me, and kind of, kind of making uh, not a fool out of me, but making it sound like you know I was not really a good bass singer because I would sing a bass line. Yeah. And then he would come right behind me and sing it an octave lower. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, that's kind of, so yeah. I, I mean, I loved him, and I learned a lot, obviously, being with him and the stamps, and so, uh, like I said, fortunately, I didn't have an ego, and it was, it was fun to be on stage with him. It's always, and it, it's hard to grasp how big a star J.D. was, and the only way I can explain it is, Elvis looked to J.D. like we looked to Elvis, that he, J.D. Yeah. was the star, that J.D. was, man, he, he Elvis just was like that. Yes. He would go to the door of the Alice Auditorium and hang out to see J.D. Uh, yes. When he, before he was the big star. Yeah, when he was like seven, what, 17 years old or yeah. 16, whatever. Yeah. yeah, he loved the gospel quartets and uh, had, a, had a huge influence on his music. Too. And if you're not a Southerner, if you grew up in the South in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of... Uh, TV shows on Sunday morning that featured, I remember Gospel Jubilee, uh, all these shows that featured these gospel quartets, and don't think gospel quartets seem like this, standing there. You guys, it's, I can see where Elvis got the, the love of moving to music. You know, uh, there was a, a group called the Statesman, and the bass singer with the Statesman, Big Chief Weather, the big, tall, Really handsome guy, one of the, one of the best looking guys in all the gospel world. He had these moves, and he would do. He would actually do his leg, you know, like when he'd go down for the low note, he'd wiggle his leg like that and this kind of stuff. And I, I don't, I can't say this for sure, but I mean, Elvis has had to start somewhere, and, and I'm yeah. sure he watched those guys all the time. Yeah. And uh, some of that probably came from Big Chief Weatherington. Yeah. Uh, in Tupelo, next to the birthplace, they, they moved the church that Elvis attended uh, when he was a kid. Uh, they moved it onto to property there, so when you come to the birthplace, you can see the actual church and go in and, and be there in the, the room where Elvis would, would go to church and, and hear singing and where he would stand up on the, the pew and, and, and sing along. Speak to us just a minute about how important um, 
the church was to to Southerners, especially Southerners like Elvis who had nothing, just had nothing. Well, as far as music was concerned, you know, unless you had a house full of musicians, yeah. um, you know, it was basically the, the place where you got your music. I mean, there was radio, of course, but it was uh, sparse. You know, not everybody had a radio. Um, so that was the place, uh, yeah. more than likely, that you got the most music and got the most influence. And because they didn't have a radio at the time, you know, that's 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 what, yeah. that's what they're hearing. And if you if you had a radio, um, again, something else I always loved, Grand Ole Opry. That's what you listen to exactly. on, on Saturday nights. Now, for you, in in the, the days on the road with stamps, you know, things have changed in the world. And now, as you travel around, like you said, you've you've toured with the big screen show, done a lot of events. Um, things have changed. With uh, take us into the. Back in the day when you guys were going from point A to point B, what a what a tour with Elvis was like. What did that involve uh, for the musicians and for really everybody traveling? Because it wasn't just Elvis walking out on stage. It was a, 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 you know an army of people who were uh, traveling in support of him. What was what, how tough was that that travel schedule and what happened? Well, um, we probably made it tougher on ourselves than <laughs> <laughs> because you know we had too much fun. Um, <laughs> when I joined the, uh, the tour, they were flying everywhere. They had two planes, and Elvis, of course, Elvis had his plane, and then there was a separate plane for the uh, singers and musicians and uh, the uh, part of the crew. Yeah. So it was pretty easy. The, the gospel tours, you know, riding on our own double decker bus, you know, was the fun that was the part that wasn't fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But in saying that, you know, people ask me, you know, what kind of a guy was Elvis? And I oh, this almost makes me tear up here, but he bought us in the in the last year. He bought <coughs> the stamps quartet did he suddenly bought us a brand new bus. He bought us a bus. <laughs> you know what the bus cost? I mean, back then, you know, of course, they were a million dollars now, but back then, they were like, what, 200,000 200, or more? He bought us a new bus to travel on. Yeah. And, of course, we, from that time on, it was, you know, we were, we were in style, we were in comfort. It's been said that, that you know, think about it, that, that when Elvis is on stage doing a rock show, wherever he is doing a rock show, on that stage, he's got gospel singers. And... Pretty much every show, at some point, Elvis did a gospel song or two and made sure to feature, by name, J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet, mm -hmm. and the Sweets, and Kathy, and everybody up there, Voice, whoever was with him, made sure to feature them. And I've always contended that there were many people going to a rock show that had their first exposure to gospel with J.D. and the Stamps, and before them, the Imperials. That uh, He made sure to include that because gospel was so important to him. He wanted to, to relay that music to his audience. Yeah. And after that rock show, especially in Vegas, if, if you were there and you were. Yeah. Vegas was my very every, first show. Though. Yeah, everybody would go, and then the other show was in the suite, and it was pretty much gospel music. Yeah. That was the party art group after a show playing they got, gospel. They got music. full of gospel music, whether they wanted it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's all he wanted to do was have, you know, stand around and sing the old gospel and the old, uh, old black spiritual songs. It was, yeah. it was his love. My friend, welcome back. Oh, my goodness. Yes, that's absolutely fine. There you go. Larry Geller, I've interviewed you so many times and it's been a while since we've been back together. Uh, 2017, in fact, this building uh, opened. I spoke here with Arco. That's right, yes. Yeah. But well, then before then, oh, for years. You know. Yeah, cruise ships, tents, That's right. anywhere that we could gather to talk to Elvis fans, and uh, we are so lucky to have him back, because if there's a storyteller in, in the Elvis world that just paints a picture and puts you in the room, it's this gentleman right here. That's no pressure. Larry. <laughs> that's exactly what I, that's my motivation. Because when I speak to you, this is the Elvis family. <clears throat> We're all friends. But I was fortunate enough to be there with Elvis. 
So I want you to walk with me. I want to put you in the room with me. I want to have you experience what I experience. Because there's nothing like it. Sometimes I'm at a loss for words to convey. You know, I was a hairstylist. I started men's hairstyling in America with J. Sebring back in 1960. We opened our doors. Men's hairstyling was never heard of. We charged $10, which is a lot of money in those days. Barbers were charging 75 cents for a dollar. So it was an experiment. We opened our doors. Our clientele was Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, Rock Hudson. I was doing Peter Sellers' hair, Henry Fonda, Glenn Campbell, Roy Orbison. I was a kid, I was 20 years old, and all this was happening. One afternoon in 1964, my phone rang, picked it up at the salon, and I said, hello. And the southern drawl said, uh, Larry, uh, I'm sitting here with Elvis Presley, and he wants to know if you want to come up to fix his hair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> After being with all these celebrities, and they all knew me by my first name, Elvis was is and will always be the icon of icons. Woo! I was so excited. Of course I said yes. So uh, Alan told, his name is Alan Fortas, whose uncle at the time was the Attorney General of America under uh, 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 Johnson. So at any rate, I packed my bag, I'm running out to the salon, and the receptionist says, Larry, Larry, wait a minute, Peter Sellers is on the phone. No. I said, you tell Peter I'll call him. I didn't care. He <laughs> <laughs> Moses, I didn't care. <laughs> any rate, drive up to Bel Air, summons meets me at the gate, drive up that winding road, Elvis' house was on Peruvia Way, atop, on this, overlooking the Bel Air Country Club. Tons of fans in the front. The gates open up. I drive in. I walk into the house. And I'm looking around, <laughs> checking everything out. Someone takes me into the den. I'm looking around, and I'm checking everything out. And about 30 seconds later, here comes Elvis. He's wearing a cap, uh, uh, a motorcycle cap, with some of the guys. And he walks up to me, and he was just glowing, just emitting energy. And he walks up and says, Hi, I'm Elvis Presley. And he said, Hi, Elvis, I'm Larry Geller. He says, Come on, we're going to my bathroom. We'll talk and you fix my hair. I said, great. See you guys later, he says. Going to the bathroom. And I expected to see uh, a star's bathroom with light bulbs around the, the mirror and a big chair, you know, comfortable. Very plain, big bathroom, nice, clean. And it was a small basin. And Elvis said, come on, we'll do it right here. So I grab a towel, I put it. And I'm so careful. Shampoo, I lather it, I'm rinsing it out. I'm not even done. And Elvis picks his head up and starts going back and forth and back and forth. And water spattering on me. He's drenched. And you know what he does? He says, Hey, Larry, what the hell, man? At least it's clean. <laughs> and when he said that, it put me at ease a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I knew where I was. Elvis was 28. I was 24. He says, come on, we'll do it right here. We sit in front of this mirror, this marble ledge. He tells me he's working on in the middle of a movie called Rostabout. He says, now Larry, you know, you can't cut too much. 
here because these scenes have to meet and they always let me do it. I know exactly what it should be done. I said, all right, man, I'm leaving the driving to you. Oh. That's exactly what he said. Yeah. Took me about 35, 45 minutes. And not a word was spoken. Now, anyone that knows Elvis knows you can't stop him from talking. <laughs> I mean, we were talking after that for years and years. That's all we would do is talk with him. In fact, he would be late for everything because we'd get into conversations about life, about politics, current events, always ending up in philosophical conversations about life and the meaning of life. And as everyone knows, beyond the jumpsuits, like I always used to say, the fans, they know me. They know me. They know Elvis Presley. They don't know me and the things that I am doing and what I want them to know. But I didn't know any of this at this point. So I sprayed his hair. And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm saying, what do you think, Elvis? And he looks, he said, ah, beautiful, beautiful. He spins around and puts his fingers just like this in my face. And he got real serious. Who are you? Who are you, Larry Keller? What are you really all about? What are you really into? I was stunned. And I, I, I was tongue-tied for a moment. And I said, well, I mean, I'm sitting with Elvis Presley. He got so serious. And I said, well, Elvis, you know what I do for a living. And I work with celebrities, and this is where I make money. This is my craft. But I hear you loud and clear. And what's more important to me than anything else in life is my search for God, for truth. Why are we here? Why does anything even exist? How did it happen? Are the scientists right? Is this all just an, an accident of chemicals evolving over billions and billions and billions of years? Or is there a God, a creator? A master plan. I said, Elvis, I read every book I can get my hands on. Spiritual books, philosophical books, metaphysical books, books on health. I became a vegetarian. I meditate, I pray. And all of a sudden, I got very, very self-conscious. Because you have to understand, in those days, People didn't talk about this. This was underground conversations. Not in so not with Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. So I said, Elvis, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know who you are. You're Elvis Presley. You're the biggest star in the world. This probably sounds corny to you. Is no man, no, 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 Larry. You have no idea how I need to hear what you have to say. And I went on, and I started telling Elvis about how I see things, about my parents and growing up, and all of that. And I always said, man, Larry, what you're talking about is what I secretly think about all the time, especially late at night when I'm going to bed. This is all I think about. He said, look, you know these guys who work for me? They're good guys. They're good guys. They do their job. But they're not interested in anything like this. Uh, what? Out of all the millions and millions of lives to, to become Elvis Presley, why me? Why me? Is it Larry? Do you know I have a twin brother? You know what I said? I didn't say. He said. I had a twin brother. He said, you know, I have a twin brother. I mean, that shows you something about his inner thinking, so to speak. As yeah, I do know I have twin sisters. They're major fans. They told me all about it. He said, his name is Jesse Garren. Why didn't he survive? What would have happened if he survived? Would you be doing his hair right now? He said, what if we both survived? Would be the Presley brothers. Uh, and there are questions that we've been talking about. 
And this conversation went on for about two hours. And I realized it was getting late. Peter Sellers, you know. <laughs> oh, it's this. I, I got to get back. Peter Sellers is waiting for me. Peter Sellers, he said. He is my favorite. He is the comedian genius of our time. And Elvis went right into Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> he did it all for years. Yeah. Good. He did it very, very well. And by the way, Elvis did a Brando like no one had ever seen. <laughs> and he went into it and he started to look like Brando. <laughs> he was really good. Yeah. But Elvis was, his talent just reeks, no matter what he was doing. If he was eating breakfast, I mean, it was you know, the energy, the frequency that was emitting from this man was something else. So um, Elvis said, listen, I got a better idea. You go back and you tell J.C. that you're quitting because you work for Elvis Presley full time. What do you think? All right.